Having mentioned purpose previously, the context of its ramifications should now be addressed, as the context can never be separated from purpose nor from its examination. Purpose is a motivation to keep each of us in the game as much as despair is. One will keep us going in the illusion prison, the other will keep us helpless in it. Yet, both can carry with it, invisible to the ego and the shadow's eye, a key to unlock realization. Both begin by being triggered through what I would call a lower script. This is a narrative developed by the time illusion to set before our ego characters a trial that always carries with it a simple yet dishonest question. Good or evil? This question is dishonest because regardless of the choice in the lower narrative, the result is further trials, further illusions, further missions, further purposes. The constructs that make up the ego feed on emotion, and so excitement is paramount to them. Excitement comes from both physical senses and mental senses, which are not our true selves. In fact, these senses are not made up of anything true. They are real, in the, sense, uh, in the same sense that a walking, talking robot is real, but not true, as they have no inner life being artificial inventions to mimic and copy it. So, in the lower script, we must understand that we are these constructs. That every time one says the word I, or if one has a direct or indirect affinity for the Old Testament, the words I am, one is actually referring to his set of artificial parts, this device made up of physicality, which are merely composites of elements, so no true thing by themselves, and of mental programming. Words, languages, are in fact programming code to allow the mind in the body to have the lower narrative. Mind you, some operating system already is included in us, uh, we call it animal instinct, but to be able to read and follow the lower narrative of our life roles, we need language. It guides us to be this, that, or the other role, to achieve or strive to achieve this or that goal, and to carry a hope or a dream that will keep us tantalized, like I've said before. As long as our true selves lie hidden from us, or being kept prisoners by the fear of loss that emerges from the construct survival programming, we are unable to return to truth, to what we are beyond the self and world devices. This construct, a artificer device that is able to build further apparatus, concepts and devices, is clearly shown in the myth of Hephaestus, the god once born in Olympus, but cast down from it uh, due to his deformity. Since then, he became a master at building illusionary life, uh, magnificent devices, but has been disconnected from his birthplace. Of course, as a side note, I am not truly equating Olympus with truth, but merely pointing out the sort of fractal analogy that the myth has with our predicament. In the same manner, we could look at Olympus and find the same recreation over and over again, born from a single fall, that of Gaia from Ether. From the Ether, itself already born of Erebus, Darkness, and Nyx, Night, Gaia came into being as matter and created Uranus as her firstborn. So entranced was she by her dream that she did not notice that instead of being the beautiful, perfect being she wished, uh, she was creating evil. In that sense, Uranus was the first Hephaestus at that level. She then, so in love with her creation, copulated, that is, got involved in mutual creation, with her son and consort Uranus, who, from above, used her matter to mold a world and its first life, artificial in this sense. The first were the titans and the giants of whom Cronus was the firstborn. He counts, in my view, as the second reincarnation of Uranus, of the Demiurge, of that false god of the material senses or of reality. He is a reinvented evolution of Uranus, 
this reincarnation wouldn't accept, as the original um, Yaldabaoth or uh, Uranus didn't accept either, that uh, another, a higher, greater one existed above him. So uh, Cronus, or Saturn if you prefer, uh, castrated Uranus, his creator, and Gaia reincarnated as his sister Rhea to be able to continue courting him in his new more fractally micro-dimension. Rhea and Cronus give birth to Zeus, and Zeus, in his stead, has, is well known in Hellenic mythology, successfully evades Cronus's attempt to prevent him from overthrowing him, as he tries to swallow all of his creation, and eventually takes over from his father. My guess is that the next in line to overthrow Zeus, in the myth, is not Ares, as is believed um, in some circles, but Dionysus, who was born from Zeus and Semele, who I think is again the next myth mythological reincarnation of the fallen Sophia, that is Gaia. But this is just my guess, as there is no other uh, overthrowing myth, myth after that one on record. But if we look around, we see that we live in the age of Dionysus, where lechery and uh, intoxication is rampant. In any case, uh, the myths, albeit not real, reveal the truth behind the fractal creation recreation and procreation that ensued since the initial fall or the initial moving away from truth. Anyway, um, all this aside, uh, we can attribute to in-depth astrology the clock, calendar and assignment functions for this lower script that I'm talking about so that the constructs can identify the proper time for events and role to play within that lower narrative of good versus evil that goes around forever if it is allowed and left to its own literal devices. That astrological context provides, consciously or unconsciously, a purpose to the ego. However, there is also a higher script, something unseen, unpredicted, and unpredictable from the point of view of the ego, of the god, or devil of an age, of reality, and the lower narrative, invisible to all these. This higher script comes in flashes and edits the narrative in slight, seemingly uneventful ways to cause disruption to the lower narrative and to allow, therefore, an opportunity for the true being, whatever we can call it, but I prefer spirit, to realize its predicament and to seek a way out. Note that this is not the equivalent of the Neo in the Matrix movies, as typically programmed in the past decade, because Neo was brought to his purpose by another character god, Morpheus, whose realm is sleep, and Neo's mission was not to end the dream world of the constructs, but to make sure it kept going despite the inevitable mass awakening. Neo was there to guide that awakening so that all the true essence's faith was placed upon himself. He carried uh, it to the master construct and offered him a deal eventually. Let those who left be gone, and I'll sacrifice myself so that your construct can keep going with those you still have. So no, this higher script, interventionist and salvationist, at its core that it is, cannot be compared to the character Neo in that well-known trilogy. Nor, nor is it at all a force of chaos, which is another illusionary term applied in a derogatory manner, to define that which seems without a type of order that the ego can discern. There is no true chaos, only a perceived chaos by lack of awareness of the order behind it. So these edits provided by the higher script, coming into reality from truth, are the sets of unlikelinesses, so to speak, that occur apparently against all odds, and that causes the inner truth to be awakened, not from the habitual external stimuli, that is, the census constructs, but from an inner deep source, ineffable to the ego observer, so much so that it seems absolutely chaotic. In summary, the lower script proceeds and unfolds over a period of time, gradually, and it leads always to the eventual change, yes, but ultimate maintenance of the illusionary world. The higher script, however, 
manifests in reality as flashes of inexplicable realization and of unexpected and unprogrammed behavior, which lead to an increased actual inner separation from the world, producing an overtaking of the undead and flouncing ego by a silent and still life force. Truth is timeless, and, therefore, it is experience within time as immediate. Now allow me to go back to the initial question of good versus evil in the lower script. We are, as ego devices, programmed to distinguish good and evil at the material and mental levels. We can understand concepts as respect and kindness, or disrespect and brutality, but they will both remain two sides of the same coin while we are operating from a physical and mental level. I know it sounds confusing, and I know that it appears that I am describing that there is no good or evil, only perceptions. That is not the case, although I understand that it seems that way. What I am saying is that if one builds a lamp that looks just like the real sun outside and attribute to the sun the source of good, then builds another lamp that looks just like the moon outside and attribute to the moon the source of evil, when we light them inside our construct called house or workshop, are they actual sun and moon? Are they true good and evil? No, they are lookalikes and cheap copies of that. Moreover, I would postulate that truth is the absolute good, good because it is not relative. It doesn't change, it doesn't decay, it doesn't depend on points of view. Truth simply is, and so true life brings with it no doubt or refutation. Therefore, absolute evil comes from the refusal to accept the truth first, and then from constructing something else that, even though it seems at a obfuscated glance preferable, it will never be truth or life. These are the forces at work within us and around us in the fantasy, are they not? Fear is our state in the absence of truth. We fear the dark because we cannot see. We fear ignorance because we cannot know. But who is it within us that cannot see? Who is it within us that cannot know? We are primed to fear the deconstruction of our ego devices by calling it death. When, in actuality, death is what we experience right now. We are primed to fear looking beyond the senses when the senses and their inherent emotional attachments are what prevents us from being able to see what these senses are. Illusions just like the world. Now this last sentence requires some additional clarification. I am not advocating for magic in the material sense. To look beyond the senses can be done with or without emotional attachment. If done with emotional attachment, its goal is to reproduce more of itself. The greedy will want more possessions to be even more greedy. The lustful will want more lechery to be even more lustful. The object of addiction promotes more addiction to itself. If done without emotional attachment, its goal is to abate its causes and to lessen the passion for the untrue, albeit real, sensations that feed the ego and, through the ego, the shadows that fell and created the illusion in the first place. So look, I say, beyond script and purpose, beyond senses, beyond constructs. You will find nothing that the ego can discern, but you will know that this nothing there is far more than this reality can ever be. It is not real, but true, and the difference is felt in ineffable ways. I reiterate, the truth speaks no words.